Hey everybody, it's uh, Leon with Bigfoot Okanagan. Uh, it's been a crazy weekend, long weekend, been all over the place. Um, just want to talk to you guys about, uh, let's put this down here. Uh, I was talking about upping your game and uh, maybe sharing some ins insights regarding of how your brain works. And if you're following me, because you guys are usually uh, new beginners online, you'll be thankful that you're getting this at the beginning of the process because a lot of the cognitive games are brain plays. Uh, unfortunately, people who are in the Bigfoot community seem to already be operating out of. So this will be helpful for people who are just starting off, and it'll also be helpful for you guys who've been doing research for a while, because these mind games that our brain plays, remember you're not your brain, you're 5.5 pounds of jelly in this skull, that it has a storing capacity of data, a lifetime of data, and 95% of that you picked up by osmosis, meaning you absorbed it from the environment. And that is going to play some havoc on your capacity to analyze things and uh, assess things if you're not aware of these little mind games that your brain plays on you. So if you can just give me a couple of seconds here <laughs> to uh, clean up a bit and uh, I'll take you on this interesting little mind trip uh, process. Thanks you guys. <laughs> Talk to you in a few seconds. Hi everybody, welcome back. Uh, it's the first time I think you've seen me without my bush clothes on. This is my academic look. <laughs> I figured if I'm going to be interviewing academics, I should at least look the part. Um, what I, so again, all I want to do on this video is just kind of show you how vulnerable the human condition is, and especially the mind, because you're not in control of your life as much as you think you are. And uh, because inside of this uh, nougat of yours, or this skull of yours, uh, you have approximately 5.5 pounds of jelly and uh, it, and that's called the brain and in that brain it consists of three brains your primal part of your brain your emotional part of your brain and your cognitive part of your brain and those three brains are not attached to each other primal being earliest developmental part of the brain and it's been it's, it's been uh, storing information for thousands and thousands of years and in that programming system of that part of the brain it does automatic research for you without you realize you're doing it. So part of these uh, cognitive setups that I'd like to talk to you about today, I'm not sure how many I'm going to cover today, but I'll put a little number on each one uh, so you get an idea which they are, uh, is to give you resources so that when you go into the bush, because if you're going into the bush, you can pretty much guarantee that the primal part of your brain is going to be activated and uh, you won't be aware that it's being activated. And when all three of those brains fire when you're in the bush, you better watch out. <laughs> because there's going to be a whole bunch of dynamics that's going to happen to your sense of awareness that you're not going to have a cognitive capacity to understand. And I think a lot of times what we end up doing is either spiritualizing the event that's happening to us or misinterpreting the event that's happening to us. So part of this is just to kind of get you started in an educational path in regards to validating. Because uh, listen, I'm as, uh, I'm as vulnerable to these uh, cognitive tricks the brain plays, and I teach this stuff. So it's important that you kind of know them uh, so that when they hit you or they're affecting you, you can double check with them to make sure that the, what your perceptions are valid or not. So what I'd like to do right now is just show you a picture. And what you're seeing right now are four black Pac-Men on a white background. That's what you're actually seeing. But there's something else that you're noticing that you're actually picking up too. And what you're actually picking up is a square. So you see four black Pac-Men on a white background, but you can't help but notice that there's a square pattern in the middle. 
and that's the primal part of your brain producing a pattern of a square. And why does your brain do that? Well, your brain does that because your primal part of your brain gets comfort from looking at patterns and structure. And it doesn't just work on visuals as well. It also works on regarding uh, thought processing. So what happens is your brain will automatically subconsciously look for patterns and also make, try to make contextual sense of something that is new, that you're not aware of, uh, having information about. It will try to figure out and put the dots together. And uh, I'm going to talk about that in, in uh, this particular video, what that's called in a, in, a, in a few other ones. So the first one I want to talk about is kind of a partnership with one that you guys are probably familiar with at home already, which is called Pareidolia. And Bigfoot Tony is awesome in regards to his videos about challenging us, about make sure you're seeing what you're seeing and you're not projecting with Pareidolia. Because Pareidolia is when you see images in things that aren't there. And that's the primal part of your brain. So you can see everything from... Uh, Clouds that look like bears, uh, pieces of forest that look like creatures, uh, uh, pieces of toast that have burnt images of Jesus in it. And again, that's your primal part of your brain projecting on it. Whether or not you're seeing it or not is another question. But your brain is looking for patterns because it gives it comfort and also gives it resources. And again, that's from our primal past existence to help us not get eaten alive when we were walking through the jungle in the old days. So, so pareidolia uh, is, again, the concept where your body is looking or your mind, the primal part of your mind, is looking for patterns. Just before I skip on to that, if you guys aren't doing anything this Saturday on Bigfoot Odyssey YouTube channel, you can check them out online, you guys for sure. Uh, Jason, Bigfoot Tony, will be interviewing me on uh, this Saturday, which is the 7th, and it's 2019 right now, in case this video is online for a while. Okay, so what's the uh, twin to pareidolia? So the twin to pareidolia is apophilia. Okay, so apophilia is a little different than par pareidolia because pareidolia works on the visual parts of our brain. So in other words, it looks for visual things that look or may represent something. So your brain formulates a pattern so it looks like you're looking at, like in that picture of there's a square box inside of those four Pac-Men. So apophilia is a little different because what apophilia does is it puts dots, connected dots, to concepts and ideas so that you perceive what you believe you're perceiving so your brain has contextual sense of making sense out of stuff that you can't figure out. And again, it does it automatically and it's, you're usually in it already. You know, if you go into an area and all of a sudden you feel uh, off a bit. And, in the, in, and you're going through the bush and as you're going off a bit, you get this sense of dread. Don't go in there. Don't go in there. Uh, then what your brain's going to do with that is try to figure out a conscious rational pattern of why you shouldn't go in there and you'll, you'll hear yourself go into a mind game there as that happens well is that me is that the environment uh, or is that am I spooking myself and you have this kind of dialogue and that's your front, front part of your cortex having a discussion with the primal part of your cortex to find out whether or not it's valid or not so epiphilia is a pattern thing that you gotta be cautious of because what it does is it tries to connect dots with what's happening in, to, in regards to inside of your body because of outside experiences or perceptions of outside experiences. But it doesn't mean that the dots you're connecting are true or valid. So you might have a mis uh, misidentification or a misdefinition of what's actually happening to you. And I find that that's pretty vulnerable to a lot of us. And it's happened to me a lot of times too. Like when we talk about mind speak, I've had mind speak. Uh, to me and being zapped and all that kind of stuff. I've had all those things happen to me. The difference is I'm clinically educated, so I deal inside of the bo in, inside of the mind a lot. And uh, if you don't, if if any of you are therapists out there, and you dealt with a psychopath or a sociopath. Uh, a lot of these terms that we're using to describe uh, mind speak and all that kind of stuff that comes in the office a lot with the, those style of personalities. And I can't explain it to the layperson at this time, but I hope to down the road. Uh, so that you guys really understand that we are vulnerable in this 5.5 pounds of jelly that is inside of this entire body where our whole perception of reality is because everything is real in our brain, unfortunately, at least from our worldview experience. So, 
So that's apophilia. Be cautious that when you're out there, apophilia is going to kick in the same way as pareidolia. Automatically, your brain's already thinking, before you're even consciously thinking about it, your brain's already processing stuff to try to come up with a story that validates your experience that you're having. But those dots that it's connecting might not be valid. So that's your first kind of cognitive trick that happens to you. So I also mentioned to you guys in a video, uh, a couple of videos back about <coughs> what's called the Dunning-Kruger effect. The Dunning-Kruger effect is a cognitive bias in which people believe that their cognitive abilities are much more greater than what they actually are. And uh, you can get this again in a variety of forms and way. And when you move up into higher education, uh, I remember when I took Greek, uh, the first year I took Greek, it would literally make your brain almost want to break in your head where we had people that were throwing their textbooks at the front of the, <laughs> the class because it was so crazy the way they were trying to teach us uh, Greek and this is Greek from 2000 years ago and uh, and then after we spent an entire year just trying to get the foundation for understanding uh, the Koinonia Greek uh, the following year, when we took our second year of it, they told us to throw everything out. <laughs> everything we learned the first year, we had to throw out. And they had to teach us the way they had to teach us so that we could get the next level of concepts for the second year of understanding how Cornelia Greek works. So, um, in that process of doing that, uh, part of the idea of Dunning Kruger effect is you think you know everything you know, but as you go, if any of you guys have gone through, uh, higher states of education and stuff like that for your master's level and that. When you first started off from high school into college for your, say, your first diploma and then your next degree and then your master's degree and your doctorate degree and your PH degree, as you go up those ladders, man, by the time you're at the top, you were so far from where you were at the beginning of what you thought life was all about, especially if you're in therapy or uh, counseling in psychology and stuff like that, is because you just don't realize how vulnerable we actually are. And part of the Dunning-Kruger effect is, unfortunately, we are so vulnerable that we like, again, parts of our brain like to be right even when we're wrong. And I think you heard me say one time, I, I, I would rather believe in nothing than project onto something. And part of the problem is, is and again, I'm as vulnerable as you guys are, is I have projected onto things hoping I was right. But the bottom line was I was projecting onto them. I wasn't right, and I had to be fair about that process. So the next one I want to talk about is what's called availability cascade. Okay, so availability cascade is when you hear something over and over and over and over again, and it's not true, but you think it's true because you've heard it over so many times. So availability cascade is you're told something that is completely wrong, but you hear it over time after time after time and it becomes true. Of course it isn't true. <laughs> but you've heard it so many times it's got to be true. Now I'm going to say this in a casual way and uh, hopefully you'll get the intent in which I mean this. Okay. So the idea, there's a couple of thoughts out there in the Bigfoot community which is uh, structures equal Sasquatch. Tree snaps equal Sasquatch. Uh, we have DNA evidence proving Sasquatch exists. Now, you've heard all three of those ideas out there. I'm not sitting here criticizing any of that. We have heard those three ideas. We've heard that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Now, the question is, where's the facts? Where's the facts? I talked to you guys about systems theory. The good thing about the Bigfoot uh, uh, topic in regards to Western culture, it's only 50 years old. So the nice thing about something being only 50 years old is we should be able to track down where all those ideologies came from. Who was the one who introduced the idea for the first time? Okay? If you look at life like Lego blocks, everything builds on what comes before. The problem is if you have a Lego block and the topic is Sasquatch, now there could be two other Lego blocks on top of that. One could be First Nations perceptions, and the other ones would be Western uh, North Americans perceptions. And the native one would go for quite a few hundreds of years as it would branch out. But there's a lot of consistency for something that's been around for hundreds of years in the First Nations and the American Indians traditions compared to these, this 50-year package that was built on the first Lego set that says Sasquatch on it in regards to perceptions. So, for instance, when you look at tree snaps, that came in in 1967 when... Uh, I think it was Titmus who had mentioned, or I think he was asked, well, you know, what do you think about these tree snaps? You think they could be associated with Sasquatch? 
and he wasn't too sure. He didn't know. Uh, but after that, in uh, every documentary you started to follow, it, uh, you started to notice that they started saying tree snaps equal Sasquatch. I think there was a documentary I watched back in 1972 where there was a guy who actually did a tree snap in the documentary by accident and, the, and the, also the uh, concept about structures. Uh, the guy who was in this documentary, uh, I wish I could remember what it is, but if I can find it I'll type it down here, but uh, he actually was sleeping in a uh, tree uh, a tree structure <laughs> that we would normally say that this is a Sasquatch and this is back in the 70s. So I thought that was kind of funny. And so again, the, the idea of is if, 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 we, if, like if we're going to be doing research, we need to research the information as well. And let's track down to find out where, where structures first came into the idea. Now John Bender Noggle in one of his books, he mentioned about uh, I think it was in Europe and stuff like that where they talked about structures being associated with Sasquatch. But uh, the late John Bendernagel, when I talked to him anyways, he, he wasn't too sure. And, and, I, and I think if you watch some of the documentaries that he was involved with with a certain person, uh, the certain person seemed to try to convince him that this was Sasquatch and that was Sasquatch. And you could see him kind of feeling a little awkward being put on the spot a bit about looking at something and going, uh, I don't know, you're kind of jumping the gun on that one, you know? And I think that's a fair way of looking at it. Because the idea that Sasquatch and structures, tree snaps and structures, DNA we have regarding Sasquatch. Man, if we had DNA regarding Sasquatch, <laughs> that would pretty well seal the deal for me. But uh, I don't want to go too far onto this because I'm going to talk about <laughs> quite a bit with this with Tony on Saturday. So uh, the idea about all this kind of stuff, just be cautious a bit about and do your research in regards to, if you can, and help me out you guys, if I'm wrong in this stuff, find out, the help me with the history. It's only 50 years old, we should be able to track it down. I'm pretty sure it won't be that far back uh, to find out what the information is on this stuff. So the next one I want to talk about is what's called confirmation bias. And look, we're all guilty of this and uh, you know, whenever you have a position about anything, that's going to be your your own particular um, confirmation in regards to what I believe in regards to my belief system about a topic or a hypothesis. So what we do is we go online and we surf the net in regards to hypotheses and concepts that we have and we look for evidence to validate what we actually believe in stuff. And I did this with structures. If, uh, I did this with structures in regards to when I came online. Remember uh, one of the things that I warn you about is the narrative that you're hearing online on these, this little square screen here. You, you don't know nothing about me. All you hear is the narrative about me. So I'm listening to a narrative of somebody saying this means this and this means that. So the next thing I do is I look for these things that these people have said and I go and I take it and then when I take it, I put it online and I ask people, is this what you're talking about? And that's coming back as yes, this is what we're talking about. Later on I find out it's totally wrong. And how do I find out it's totally wrong? Well, because I do the research that needs to be done to validate whether or not the information is true by finding out uh, whether or not uh, what I was told compared to what the reality of the situation that I'm dealing with and looking at is goes with the context of uh, the story that I've been told. And unfortunately, I found out that it wasn't correct. But what we like to do with confirmation bias is we'll go online and do our one-click research and uh, and we'll look for something that actually, oh bam, yeah, there, that, uh, that's what that means, that's what that means. Well, listen, when I teach courses and stuff like that, I like to get my students to do something and what that is is uh, go see great PhD debaters from two different uh, schools of thought and have and listen to how they debate. Well, the nice thing is they debate usually with respect towards each other, so a discussion can be uh, had, and so that the brain can be expanded in regards to ideologies and thinking processes. And uh, and you don't have to agree with one side or the other side. You might even take a position of one side, but you can accept the other person's position because you have what's also called an empathy regulator, uh, and you want to find out why they think why they think that way. So the problem with confirmation bias is the first link we stop to that agrees with what our perception is or our hypothesis we're building, we go, ah, yeah, we're right. But we ignore every other link about the same topic. Uh, we just look for the stuff that we want to look for, not the stuff that we need to hear, because it doesn't make us feel very good inside.